Thank you very much, and also I want to thank all the organizers for uh, setting this up, and uh, all of you as well for being here. So in general, I'm interested in um, understanding which kind of functions deep learning is, uh, is good at learning. And uh, for instance, I think that deep convolutional neural networks are very good at learning uh, hierarchically compositional functions, which I will define over the course of the talk. And today, I would like to tell you about our latest uh, uh, work on this uh, random hierarchy model, which is a model of uh, uh, correlated data, where we think you can understand why convolutional networks, deep convolutional networks, are good at learning uh, a specific set uh, of tasks. Okay, this is, first of all, it's all joint work with uh, my group at uh, EPFL. The general setting of the talk is that of understanding the, the success of deep learning, as it was put by uh, this guy in this paper, the unreasonable effectiveness of deep learning. And so let me just start by reminding you uh, about the, the, the striking difference that there is between the uh, huge success of deep learning at many tasks, and here I've put just the examples, uh, ImageNet, AlphaFold, ChatGPT, opposed to the lack of our fundamental understanding of uh, why these uh, methods are so successful. And one specific question that I would really like to be able to answer when I look at these models is, how much data do you need to learn a task once you know the task? So let me start by uh, doing a little recap of what's known in the, uh, in the literature. First of all, deep learning architecture learn from high dimensional data, and we all know that uh, these data are affected by the cursor dimensionality. Because basically, typically, in high dimension, uh, if you throw a fixed number of points, their distance will uh, uh, decay very slowly with the, as you increase the number of points that you throw. This generally means that certain tasks, for instance, regressions, are, uh, which require a small distance between uh, the data points that you sample, are going to be very difficult. And they're going to require a number of points to be solved, which is exponential in the input dimension. So if the input dimension is of order 100, this is like 10 to the 40, which is huge. On the other hand, and here I borrow, I hope Sebastian doesn't mind for borrowing this picture. We know that uh, uh, tasks like image classification are learnable. And uh, the reason is for, for which they are learnable is that they are highly structured. And this is an example of the uh, hidden manifold model in which there is this assumption uh, according to which the data lie on a, on a manifold within the input space. And not just, you know, an image of a horse is not just a random point in the dimension. It's something more than that. Not only. Uh, each data point is uh, uh, not a uniform point in a, uh, a d-dimensional space, but also the tasks we want to learn are not generic functions of these points, but they are very structured. And you need all of this in order to understand. For instance, take a data set like SciFar, which I think is what the images here are taken from. And uh, you can uh, estimate the, what's the effective dimension, let's say, if you wish, of the data manifold. You're going to find something which is not the number of pixels, but less, 35, for instance. Not for instance, I mean, it's something close to 35. But then, uh, you only have 10 to the 4 data uh, in, uh, in uh, Cypher 10, and you know you can learn from those data. So 10 to the 4 is much less than e to the power 35. Therefore, what's missing is uh, uh, information about the structure of the task you want to learn. Therefore, the question of how much data you need to learn really becomes two questions, in a sense. On the one hand, you have what is the structure of the task. On the other hand, you have uh, how uh, a method, for instance, a deep neural network, exploits the structure to learn. So now I'm gonna, I, I want to present you three uh, ideas which have been po put forward in the, uh, in the field for, this, uh, for solving this riddle. Uh, the first one, which I uh, actually like, and we have seen, uh, in a sense, examples of this in the, in, in the past talks, is that learnable tasks are those that uh, maybe depend on low-dimensional projections of the input uh, data. So although uh, inputs live in a large dimensional space, then the function uh, which I identify with the task to learn only depends maybe on a few variables, let's say one or two or, or whatever. And this, is, uh, this idea has given rise to a very nice uh, line of work of which I only really represented my, my, my sort of few favorites, but there's many of them and uh, uh, it's uh, quite powerful because it allows a lot of uh, analytical uh, and rigorous insight. And also uh, it works because uh, people have understood that shallow neural networks are able to uh, adapt to this uh, low dimensional structure, to discover low dimensional structures. And therefore, you know, you have both the mechanism for the, both the structure of the data and the mechanism for networks to adapt to it. But of course, uh, there are limitations. 
Uh, one of it, one, one limitation is that uh, in this framework, I don't think you can understand what's the advantage of a deep neural network over or a deep neural network over a shallow uh, neural network, and in a sense, not even the advantage of a convolutional neural network over a uh, fully connected neural network. Right? Let's think about the fact that convolutional neural networks are really the architecture we uh, we think of when we say that you know in 2016 they started winning this uh, ImageNet challenge and uh, and so on. Secondly. And this is something I've personally also uh, contributed to. Uh, you can show that for this architecture, it's not really uh, understood why uh, feature learning, so learning features, should be beneficial for a, a deep neural network. And this is something we have uh, uh, analyzed in this uh, work that I put here, which I won't mention in the rest of the talk, but I'd be happy to uh, talk about offline if anybody wants. So we need to go beyond this. And the first uh, uh, sort of immediate generalization you can make is that uh, you go from uh, uh, depending on a few low-dimensional projection to be uh, invariant or approximately invariant to a more generic symmetry, to a generic transformation. Why uh, do I say this as generalization? Because, of course, depending on projection means that you're invariant to all rotations that leave those projections unchanged. And here I'm just saying, OK, I want to be invariant to a larger set of transformations, maybe. And uh, what uh, uh, really people had in mind when they introduced this in uh, 2013 and 16, by joint work by John Bruna and uh, Stefan Malla, were deformations of images. So images, uh, the content of an image is invariant to a small deformation of uh, the image itself. This is a continuous symmetry. So there's lots of uh, degrees of freedom uh, that you can, uh, OK, the image is dimensional, but there's lots of degrees of freedom that you can actually lose. So you don't really need to think about it as a, such a high dimensional object. But then, uh, in this case, it's not so clear how neural networks uh, are going to be able to learn this invariance from only a finite set of uh, uh, example data, first of all. And in fact, you know, if you wish, uh, people know that when they know there is a symmetry in the data, they prefer to use uh, equivalent architectures because of this. And uh, even in this case, it's not really clear what's going to be the advantage of deep networks over uh, uh, shallow neural networks. There's no an intuitive connection between the uh, symmetry for smooth transformations and uh, depth of the architecture that is going to learn the data. Therefore, we go to hypothesis three, which is uh, what I'm going to focus on then for the rest of the talk, which is that learnable tasks are hierarchically compositional. And by this, I really mean, um, for those of you who have uh, uh, never heard of this, uh, this idea, is that uh, you can think of a function as a tree, where the leaves of the tree are the, uh, the components of the input. And then you have the nodes of the tree, which are like computations. And you do local computations, and then you keep putting all these local computations together in a hierarchical manner until you get to the label or the target uh, function, as you would like to call it. This idea was introduced in 2016. And uh, the corresponding hypothesis for how uh, neural networks uh, learn this uh, kind of structure actually came before the uh, idea of uh, hierarchical compositionality of, era of uh, tasks. And is that deep neural networks, because they are deep, they are able to learn more and more abstract representations of the data as you go through the layer. So they will learn, let's say, in very simple terms, I can say, um, maybe they will learn very simple concepts like, I don't know, edges on an image at the very first layers, and then more complex features towards the end, closer to the output. Uh, this is a picture to like uh, exemplify sort of this idea of uh, uh, hierarchical compositionality of an in the context of an image, and I think this is really providing an intuitive idea of what could be the advantage of, uh, of depth, because you have already depth in the, uh, in the data, so it's only natural that you match it with the, uh, a learning method, which is deep. And also, because you learn this representation, which are, uh, on the one hand, more complex, but also more abstract, this could explain the uh, progressive reduction of dimensionality, which is observed in the hindered representation of uh, trained deep convolutional networks. So, this is the hypothesis, again, uh, I'm going to follow. I'm going to frame uh, our model inside this hypothesis. So before going on, I would like to give you a bit more details of uh, uh, what is known in the field of, uh, um, like what is known about uh, uh, deep learning for hierarchical compositional functions, not in order of, uh, not in chronological order. Uh, first of all, from this work of Smith Eber in 2020, we know that hierarchical compositional functions can be, in principle, reconstructed with uh, uh, a number of examples, which is polynomial in the input dimension. This is really like, uh, I don't know if it's right to call it like that, but it's kind of an information theoretic result, right? You, you know that there is the information there to reconstruct the, uh, the function from these points, but you don't know if there is an algorithm or, uh, uh, or whatever. Then we also know that uh, deep convolutional networks actually are able to represent this function efficiently, efficiently, 
what do I mean? I mean that if I compare how many neurons I need in a fully connected network, which is shallow, and how many neurons I need to represent this function at approximation level, on a deep convolutional network, I will need much less in the deep convolutional network, like exponentially less. But again, nothing about uh, learning and generalization. We also know, and this is my contribution and uh, my colleagues, that uh, uh, for those of you who are interested in the kernel regime and lazy, lazy training regime, these networks uh, are actually cursor dimensionality when learning hierarchical target when they uh, work in the kernel regime. So we do really need feature learning for, uh, uh, for this kind of problem. And also it was understood, uh, last point as well, that uh, what's important for, this, uh, for deep uh, learning architecture to uh, actually learn from this type of functions is that there exists some sort of correlation between each of the uh, input points. If each, I don't mean each of the input points, I mean each of the parts of the input. So if you think of an input as a d-dimensional uh, sequence, each element of this sequence has to be somehow predictive in a way of the label for deep learning to, be able to pick up these correlations and like work on them, do its magic, and uh, uh, generalize eventually. OK, so within this framework, we would like to build a model of a hierarchically compositional task. And we really want to build a model which is simple enough such that we can understand what's the sample complexity of deep learning uh, methods learning this model, and how to relate the sample complexity to the structure of, uh, of the task. And this is what I'm going to do in the next one or less 10 minutes. We call this model the random hierarchy model. And uh, let's start. OK, this is a bit bad. Yes. Let's start again with this image, right? I want to uh, really stress this aspect of uh, uh, hierarchical compositionality. Uh, so we'll have the dog on the left, the image. You can think of uh, the image itself as a, a representation of uh, the abstract concept of dog, which is the class. And then you can think of this uh, abstract concept as me made by uh, composing two lower level concepts, which in this case are going to be the head and the pose of the dog, but it can be really whatever. And then each of these themselves is going to be made again by composing lower level uh, features. So what are going to be uh, the, the sort of parameters that we need to describe this kind of structure? First of all, uh, we have a parameter which uh, uh, is the depth, basically, because the class label is determined by a a hierarchy of compositions, and how many compositions do you have in this hierarchy is the depth of the model, L. Then, uh, at each level, you have that one high-level feature corresponds to several sub-features, like the dog corresponds to head and paws, the head corresponds to eyes, nose, and mouth, and so on. And I have another parameter, which is the number of sub-features that I have at each level. Individual sub-features might be also shared. Um, for this point, maybe you can think of, uh, uh, you need to think of something more general, the picture of the dog on the left. For instance, you can think of, uh, I don't know, uh, an image uh, data set where you have dogs and birds, and uh, the, both dogs and birds have heads, but the birds doesn't have paws. The birds have uh, 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 wings, so the head will be a shared feature between both the dog and the bird. And to have shared features, basically, uh, uh, I assume that uh, at each level, all the sub-features are taken from the same uh, finite vocabulary. And I'm going to call the size of this vocabulary V. And then we also in include another ingredient, which is uh, the fact that uh, at each level, you can have several groups of sub-features which lead to the same high-level feature. You might have a dog by composing different type of heads and paws and backgrounds and so on. And we call this number multiplicity uh, M. By the way, if there are any questions at any point, please uh, feel free to, uh, to ask. And this is a kind of uh, idea of uh, introducing these uh, hierarchical generative models was introduced in uh, this paper in 2013 by Mossell and in uh, 2018 by uh, Eran Malak. OK, and once we know all these uh, numbers, we sort of forget about the uh, the dog and think about it in more abstract uh, terms. So where we really have like a, a, a number which will be the label of a classification problem. And then this label generates a set of uh, high level images, which themselves generate sets of uh, high level images and, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. Are there any questions on the, this idea?
I want to again uh, make another example for this uh, semantic multiplicity idea, which is uh, if, let's say, zoom in on uh, one level of the hierarchy, one compositional rules, we have that uh, uh, on each level, a high-level feature can be represented with m distinct strings of, uh, yes, please. It's always shrinking going up. Okay, no, uh, I really, I, no, I really, I really don't think of this as a, um, I really don't think of my feature. This is an important point, actually, thank you. Uh, I really don't think of this, uh, let's say, Azure uh, Square as the poles. I think of it as a number which represents the, the sort of abstract idea of Po. It's really like a high-level feature which I take from my finite vocabulary. And it's like a single uh, number. And then it doesn't matter because uh, um, once you generate the model, what you give to the network is the uh, input and the output. So here in the middle, you can really put whatever uh, you want. It's completely uh, oblivious of what's the representation that you choose of the of the inner feature, but really think of them as uh, uh, um, individual numbers. Like that's just one number. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and so uh, what I was is that, uh, um, yeah, at each level, I have features can be represented with, uh, uh, in uh, several distinct ways. And uh, I'm gonna call all the distinct ways of representing the same features at a higher level uh, just synonyms, because they are in fact synonyms. They have the same, uh, uh, they are groups of objects that have the same meaning on the higher level of the hierarchy. Okay, given this kind of uh, uh, generative models, uh, Malak and uh, Charles Schwartz understood that uh, if you have a correlation from the input pixel and the label, by correlation I really mean that uh, you know, you can look at your data set and count, uh, uh, given that I observe blue on the left uh, corner of the, of the input image, what's the probability of uh, being in a certain class with respect to another? And if this probability is different than the random uniform, it means that uh, each single element of the input is gonna be predictive somehow uh, uh, of the label. And if you have this, then uh, they show that you can uh, exploit this correlation by a combination of uh, clustering algorithms and layer-wise gradient descent to learn this kind of problems. What is gonna be our contribution is to, uh, on the one hand, generalize, uh, on the one hand, make a specific assumption, but on the other hand, claim to uh, find a general result in the sense that I'm gonna make further assumptions on the structure of this model, which uh, are gonna be uh, letting me compute what are these correlations and how they affect deep learning. But then, because I'm gonna use less rigorous techniques, I'm gonna uh, use them to explain uh, uh, just uh, the performance of uh, deep neural networks in a standard training where you train all the layers at the same time. So if the program is, uh, is clear, I will go forward with the assumption. And the main assumption is that at each level of the hierarchy, uh, in our models, we chose the uh, rules at random, in the sense that we chose the uh, which basically strings of uh, low-level features are assigned to a certain high-level feature, uniformly at random from all the possible assignments of uh, uh, low-level features to uh, high-level features. And this is really a, you know, a simple uh, combinatorial problem. You have a finite set of low-level features, which you have to, uh, and you, have, you know that you have to assign M of them to each of the V high-level features, and you just pick this uniformly at random from all possible assignments. Pretty simple. What's important about this uh, random assignment is that uh, uh, it's crucial in using correlation. Why? Here I showed uh, in a very limited setting where I have uh, this parameter s which tells me the size of the, the low level feature uh, to two, and I have uh, the multiplicity three, and also the vocabulary size is three because I only have blue, green, and uh, uh, orange at the bottom. And on the left, you have an example of a random choice. On the random choice, you see that you have this property of the single uh, pixels, if you wish, being already predictive of the, uh, uh, of the high-level features. If I see a blue dot on the left, 
I know that it's going to be more likely to have a, uh, a, a gray high-level feature than, uh, than not. And the same you can say for the orange and the green and so on. On the left, I've shown, uh, to make a comparison, another possible choice you can make in which you distribute equally all features among, uh, uh, all low-level features among high-level features. In this way, you've completely killed all the, uh, all the correlations because uh, if you see each uh, of these columns have a blue, a orange, and a green. So there is no way I can tell what's going to be the high-level feature just by looking at the low-level one. So randomness of the choice induces correlation, and this is a very important point to remember for later. And here I want to have a uh, uh, recap of this model. I think it's going to be very unlikely. It's actually, uh, I don't have now the number on top of my head, but we, 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 we computed this number in the, uh, well, it's not published, but it's a draft, but we have this, uh, this analysis in the draft. It's actually a very low probability that you end up with a, if you throw your rules at random, there's a very low probability that you have, because for having an homogeneous uh, um, uh, case like this one, what needs to happen is that whenever you pick which uh, uh, low-level features you're going to assign to each high-level feature, you have to pick select, uh, exactly one of each, which is very unlikely, if you think about it. It's a very special point in the, in the space of all possible uh, uh, assignments. Of course, once I, I, at some point I'm going to send uh, uh, M and V to be large, which means I'm going to have many of them. And if I have many of them, on average, there is going to be one of each color, right? But then if you look, that's the average. If you look at the single realizations of the model, that's not the case anymore. You will have, uh, uh, you will have these fluctuations and you will never have, uh, well, you, you won't have uh, uh, homogeneity with very high probability vanishing uh, when you send uh, the number of synonyms M to, uh, to be very large. So let's say when I read it's 10, this probability is going to be, I think, 1 over uh, 200 or something like that. Okay. Okay. So this is the recap of this, uh, uh, of this model in which you have a, uh, a fixed number of classes and see this parameter which is the semantic multiplicity of each uh, uh, concept. S, M, S which is just the number of uh, uh, sub-features you branch out in at every level. Basically S is the number of, uh, uh, you know, if S is two, this is, who's gonna, this is, uh, this is S is two in this case in which you have a binary tree in general we level S, A, D. Uh, uh, three. V is the size of the vocabulary in the sense that each of these, uh, uh, this means that basically the yellow uh, square is going to be filled with the one out of uh, uh, NC number, the number of classes. Whereas each other square is going to be filled with the one out of V number because I have vocabulary size V. Of course, I could have these numbers to you know, depend on the, uh, on the layer and have different one at every level, but for simplicity, I'm going to keep them like that. And finally, you're going to have L, which is a capital L, which is the deep, the depth <coughs> of the hierarchy. And this is really how you generate your data set. So you start from, a, you pick, let's say, a label at random, one number out of uh, uh, the number of classes. From this number, you, you, you generate a random rule. And with this random rule, you generate all possible uh, uh, representation for each of these classes. And you know that each classes can be represented in M different ways. Once you have the representation, all the elements of the, you choose another rule. And all the elements of this representation, which are the light green and light blue, you assign to them further M distinct couples, and you go at the next level, and so on until you uh, repeat these L times and you get your whole data set. OK. And here I wanted to uh, um, summarize a few properties of, uh, uh, of this model. First of all, by uh, repeating this procedure, as I just told you, you generate, uh, given the number of classes, so the multiplicity M and the parameter S and L, you generate a number of uh, data, which is this Pmax over here. What's important is that it's uh, exponential in the dimensionality of the input. The dimensionality of the input, of course, is going to be uh, S to the L, because every time, for every level, you branch out into S different uh, uh, possibilities. Then, 
uh, by construction, the class label in this model is going to be a hierarchically compositional and local function of the, uh, of the input. By which I really mean this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of computation that I, uh, that I brought here, right? First you put together x1 and x2 to make one feature, and then you put together x3 and x4, and so on and so forth. And then you put these two together, and this is a very special uh, structure for the label. Furthermore, the label is symmetric whenever I exchange uh, semantically equivalent uh, uh, low-level features. And also, uh, as I showed earlier, the random choice of rules has induced some correlation between the input feature and the label that I can compute. Okay, hoping this is clear, I'm gonna go forward. And now start discussing the sample complexity of this model, which is uh, what I'm ultimately interested in. Okay, so there are two simple uh, characteristic sample sizes starting from uh, just the definition of the model. One is the maximal number of, well, the total number of uh, uh, points in a data set, which is a function of the parameters, which is uh, the p max below, and it's exponential in the input dimension. Remember, the input dimension is uh, s to the l. But you also have a, a, a minimal number of training points, which uh, I define as the minimal number that you need to reconstruct uh, the model. And, uh, Think about the model as just, the model is really just made of the L rules that I've chosen at random. Each of these rules is the assignment of M strings of sub-features to one out of V high-level features, which means that each of these uh, rules takes M times V points to, like, uh, to, be, to, to be learned, to be, to be fixed completely. And so I just multiply this number by L, and I get what I call the minimal number of uh, uh, points that I need to learn this model. And uh, uh, if you wish, you can get a more uh, uh, rigorous understanding of this by thinking about, uh, you know, the classical, um, um, when you consider algorithms such as a search in a, a hypothesis class of all the possible uh, hierarchical random hierarchy models. So knowing the generative model, I know that uh, there is only a finite number of uh, functions compatible to that. And if I compute the logarithm of the number of these functions, I get this uh, p-min, which is a typical information theoretic bound for uh, uh, for learning. And then uh, the sample complexity is going to be, uh, the actual sample complexity of deep convolutional network is going to be in the middle. And uh, I'm going to give it to you already. It's uh, going to follow this formula, just the number of classes times this multiplicity m to the power l, which is, uh, uh, well, two important features of this is that, first of all, it's polynomial in the input uh, uh, dimensions, which is nice because we're not suffering from the curse of dimensionality. Secondly, it's completely, um, uh, independent of the vocabulary size, but it only depends on this uh, uh, semantic multiplicity m. Basically, you have that uh, the number of points you need per each class is m to the power l. Okay, now I want to try to show you how we think we understand where this uh, sample complexity comes from. And uh, uh, the question I want to ask to get to this, uh, to this answer is how to learn the, uh, a random hierarchy model. Because of these properties that I've introduced, the natural approach, if you think about it, will be to learn first the uh, semantic class of low-level patches. So I don't want to learn already from the input, from the input string, I don't want to learn the class yellow. But what I want to do first is to understand that blue and orange means uh, purple, and that uh, green and red means uh, brown. And if I can do that, then I my claim is that I can reduce the dimensionality from S to the L to S to the L minus one, because basically I go back one level in the hierarchy. And if I do this successfully, and if I iterate this procedure L times, then I'm gonna solve the model. Relatively simple, but uh, is it really the case? Uh, and to check whether it is the case, what we can do is the following experiment. We consider a, a deep convolutional network, which has more or less the same structure as the, uh, as the model. So uh, the same depth as the model and the filter size matching with the number of sub-features per each high-level feature. And what we can uh, look at for uh, answering this question is what I call uh, uh, semantic sensitivity of the representation. So you train the network, you look at the hidden representation, so how the neurons of the first layer of the network respond to each input. And then you play a game of uh, switching elements of the input 
with other elements, which can be synonyms or not. And then you ask yourself, what's the difference in output, in the, in the representation, when I switch when, when, when I replace the, an element with a, a synonym, or if I replace an element with the, uh, something which had a completely different meaning, right? For me, for the network to be able to successfully solve the task, you have to be invariant to uh, uh, switching an element with its synonym. And this is exactly a measure of that. And what you can see on the left is that there is clearly a uh, uh, characteristic number of uh, training points such that you become, you acquire this invariance, right? You go from uh, something close to one to something close to zero, a typical uh, sigmoidal, uh, sigmoidal shape. And then if you collapse all these curves, and you di these curves are obtained for different parameters of the model, so different vocabulary sides, number of uh, uh, classes and multiplicity. But if you collapse all these curves by the sample complexity I showed you before, then you see that they all more or less follow the same uh, 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 master curve, and they all go down around uh, uh, 10 to the 0, which is 1, meaning that this number, P star, is in fact uh, the number of training points such that the hidden representation of the neural network become invariant to exchanges of synonyms in the model. And we claim that this is also what we claim. We show that this is also uh, what controls generalization. Here I'm showing, I'm doing the same kind of plot, but I, what I'm showing is the test accuracy of, uh, uh, of these models on uh, unseen, unseen examples. Again, you have this type of uh, uh, sigmoidal-like pictures is, of course, the, the, the zero is not shown because it's logarithmic also in the, uh, in the, in the y-axis. But basically, again, you have curves that decay at different, level, different training set sizes, but then once you collapse the training set sizes, once you divide the training set sizes by the sample complexity scaling, which I found, and C times m to power l, you find collapse, meaning that uh, uh, the random Minaki model is, in fact, learned by a deep convolutional network with uh, this number of training points and C times M to the L. V is the vocabulary size. L is the, L is the depth. Okay. M is the multiplicity. Is that how many? That's how many different, uh, uh, let's set S equal to, how many different pairs in the, at the lower level correspond to the same uh, feature at the higher level? And C is the number of classes. And C, it's really not super important. You can think of, uh, you, you can divide P by NC and say, okay, that's, uh, if per you wish, class, per class, yeah. Class, yeah. So what's the architecture of the network? Like it's a convolutional network much to the structure of the problem, actually. So the filter size uh, is the same as the, um, sorry, here. It's a deep convolutional network. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're just put like this. They're like put on a string. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. It's a one D. It's a it's a one D convolution. But you can you can make it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Filter of size two. But you could you could make it uh, two D if you want because this is really. Um, I mean, the, the structure of the, of the input in the end is completely irrelevant. What you really need is that, you know, these two are going to be close to each other because they correspond to the same, uh, because they correspond to the same level feature. They're also going to be close to each other in a spatial sense. Yeah, no, it's just one bit. Yeah. Uh, what are you swapping, essentially? I'm swapping, uh, uh, for instance, uh, I'm swapping the semantically equivalent uh, representation, so couples of pixels in this case. For instance, here I have that, uh, this is an example of this, uh, a gray pixel at the higher level, which is like hidden, can be represented both as uh, red and uh, purple, and uh, as orange and green. When I exchange synonyms, I mean if I exchange a red and a purple with a uh, orange and a green, because they mean the same thing at the higher level. Sorry? If it's con if the structure of the network contains the archi model, yes. It has to be deep enough. 
Yeah, yeah. Actually, I, I haven't tried, but my guess is that with smaller filter size and more depth, though, you will still be able. But uh, it's a bit more complex because then you have to skip, right? You have to, uh, the first level of the model will be the second level of the network. So you have to be careful at which representation becomes invariant to, uh, to what. But module all that, I think you can, like you don't need the matching exactly. When I generate a data set, I have, uh, I, I have all of it, if you wish. And I know, uh, because I've chosen the rules, I know which couples are, uh, uh, are synonyms between each other. Like the generation of the data set is really, uh, I choose a rule per layer. And once I have the rule per layer, starting from the, the uh, I don't really sample, I just generate them all, let's say. And then when I train, I only pick a, uh, a fraction of them. Okay. And because I've generated them uh, uh, with the specific procedure, I know which one are the synonyms. There was some other uh, hand, or maybe not. Okay. Okay, this is an example, for instance, of uh, a, um, um, relating to the question of, uh, uh, of Alessandro, where we trained a um, shallow, fully connected network, which is still able to represent the, uh, the target function, but it's not gonna be able to adapt to this uh, structure because simply it doesn't have enough depth to represent the model. Therefore, uh, the sample complexity here is uh, the maximal number of training points. So I need to see a finite fraction of the whole data set in order to learn. Whereas if I'm, uh, if I'm deep enough to represent the, uh, if the network is deep enough to represent the hierarchy, then it will follow the sample complexity of the architecture which is matched. Although, I mean, the, there are prefactors which I cannot control. So let's go a bit into the, uh, like how do we come up with this guess? By the way, how am I doing on? Uh... Uh, okay. In total. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, okay. No, I, I think it's fine. To do this, how do you do it? Uh, it turns out you can do it by simply counting occurrences. So just a little notation. I'm going to uh, call with this mu couples of uh, uh, low-level features, so which are the objects that have the same meaning uh, above. And if I count uh, that number over there, what's the number of data which have fixed label alpha having feature mu one, let's say, on the first patch? This number, because different patch, different uh, uh, synonym patches have the same meaning, this number will be invariant to exchange of patches. So based on this number, I can build an invariant representation. This is all I want to say. And you can compute statistics of this number on different realizations of the, of, the, of the model. So you can estimate what this number is gonna be like. And then you ask yourself, okay, uh, how, much, uh, uh, how many points do I have to sample when I want to uh, get the empirical version of this number or a finite training set in order to find, uh, to get a result which is closer to the real number? And that gives you basically a, uh, ah, I'll skip all this, a signal to noise uh, type of uh, trade-off. By balancing signal and noise, you can find a sample complexity. And I think I'm going to skip this. Thank you all and leave you with the conclusion slides. Uh, 
I think it's an, it's an interesting point, but it's a, it's a subtle question how to scale things to, to make that emerge, because uh, even the fully connected network, which is um, uh, not deep at all, a shallow fully connected network, sorry, which is not deep at all, so one hidden layer, will uh, has enough uh, expressive power to learn the model. It's just that it will learn it when it's seen a finite fraction of the, of the training uh, of the data set. So you, you, rather than having that, you will have different curves which decay at different points. If the x-axis is the number of training examples, by having different models at different depth, Okay, I, uh, yeah, I, uh, I see your point. Uh, we, we, haven't, uh, we, have, we haven't done that. What I can tell you, though, is that uh, this, uh, for instance, the, the convolutional networks here, especially for uh, L equal, well, L is not huge, it's three. Depth three convolutional networks, they have, they are, uh, they have much less parameters than the, the fully connected networks that I've shown here, and then they perform. Because the, um, I mean, for training, uh, for, for the fully connected network to fit all this data, you really need, uh, uh, let's say, 10,000 uh, hidden neurons. Whereas for uh, this to fit the data, actually, you need uh, order uh, 30 neurons in each, uh, in each layer. So now I, uh, what's the parameter count? I have to square it at some point, right? But. I have a, uh, it's, it's, it's empirically observed. I know that uh, I have a picture where we have this uh, one, one gradient step picture which shows us that uh, the, um, you can base yourself on the statistics of these numbers of occurrences. And we know that actually this number P star of simple complexity comes from uh, a sort of a signal to noise ratio uh, matching on this number. So when is it that I have enough sample in my training set to correctly estimate these uh, numbers that I'm showing here? But then that, that we only relate to actual training in this one step GD picture and not in the full training of a deep neural network. And about the, the, the I didn't understand maybe the part about the, the low word bound match. Yeah, I'm wondering if this uh, P star is taking into account the fact that the number of neurons that you expect to have in the radius of the other one. You can, I, well, there are some, uh, it's, it's going to be long, so. Uh, if you want, I can tell you offline, probably. I think you can do better, but with other methods, not with the pure uh, uh, gradient descent on all layers at the same time. You can, you can. It's just uh, an attempt, if you wish, and a framework in which we were able, uh, but you, you need to have the, um, uh, these correlations, no matter where they come from. In this case, it's a model in which the correlation comes from the randomness, and we can compute them exactly as a function of uh, all the other parameters in the model, right? What we also know is that if you don't have correlations at all, you will not learn. It's like a, uh, if you know the, the parity problem, it's like a parity function. Yeah. Okay. So cool. Let's take the remaining questions of one day and see what you're speaking. It looks like a good report. Thank you.